Hello and welcome to the HOA Show, where we discuss the news, problems, trends, and critical issues relating to life in a homeowner association. Join us every episode, and together we'll explore how to survive and thrive in the dizzying world of HOAs. Hello and welcome to the HOA Show. I'm Ryan Gazelle, and today I'm joined by Adrian Adams of Adams Sterling Professional Law Corporation. So here are just a few of Adrian's many, many accomplishments. He is one, a founding member of the CID Law Organization, two, a founding member of the Critical Issues Think Tank of the National Foundation of Community Association Research, which I want to know about later, a board member on the Foundation of Community Association Research, a member of the Task Force on Aging Infrastructures, past member of the boards of directors for LA and Orange County chapters of Community Association Institute, past delegate on the California Legislative Action Committee, and probably most notable for your creation of the davissterling.com website. So uh, thanks for joining us here, Adrian. I'm happy to be here. My pleasure. These are just a few of your small accomplishments. Uh, so Adrian, how long have you been practicing law? Well, I got into the industry for uh, HOAs back in 1981. So it's been now, what, 40 years approximately. As an attorney? Involved, no, in starting out in the industry as a manager and quite by accident falling into it and becoming a, an on-site manager of a large lake association, followed by a large equestrian association, then followed by a high-rise. In Southern California? All in Southern California. And that led to my interest in managing large-scale resorts. So I then went on to get my MBA and was ready to launch into resort management when I was approached by a law firm, uh, one I'd been working with uh, with the various associations, who asked me to consider going into law school and specializing in this area of the law. So the law firm <laughs> asked a community manager to go to law school for them? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, that's exactly what happened. And my initial response was, no chance. I'm, there's no way I'm going to do that. I'm done with school. I'm going to do resort management. And they urged me to really consider it. So I then called another partner of another law firm and said, let's go to lunch because I have questions for you. And said, what do you think about this proposal that I go into law and go work for this law firm? He said, that's a terrible idea. You don't want to do that. You want to go to law school and come work for us. <laughs> and so that basically is what cinched it. And then I changed direction and went to law school. So this is around... Uh, 1990. 1990. Okay, right. so you went to law school. And then how did you get involved with Lawrence Sterling? Once I got out of law school, I had a line of clients waiting for me because I was already well known as a you know, large-scale on-site manager. And spent some time with the one of the law firms. And then at that point, decided it was time for me to start my own law firm and started, uh, launched my own, and then decided it was time. This was in 2000 mm -hmm. and beginning of the, you know, really internet, a lot of stuff going on, websites being created and decided at that point that I would do two things. One, create a website called davisterling.com. Which there was nothing like that at the time. Nothing. And there really still isn't. Uh, it's become the largest research website of its kind in the nation. I'm on it probably four to five times a week. Absolutely. And that, the idea being, because having been a manager coming out of it, there was a real need for information and something readily accessible. And it seems to me that the internet was the best way to do that, creating a website for the Davis Sterling Act and, you know, all stuff related to associations. That then was followed by the first electronic newsletter of its kind in our industry. And I was publishing weekly articles about the industry. And I got an email, started getting emails from different people saying, oh, this is great, really enjoy them. And I have a question. And so then I would answer questions, put the question, give an answer, and just like open the floodgates. And we were getting a huge amount of traffic coming in. And one day I got an email saying, great job, really love what you're doing, signed Larry Sterling. So I emailed back and I said, are you the Larry Sterling, the <laughs> author of the Davis Sterling Act? He goes, yeah, that's me. And uh, so we got together. He uh, lives in San Diego. And we had lunch. And at that point, we talked about him joining the firm, and he did. And so we had then became Adam Sterling and moved forward 
uh, with that. And he's just a fabulous guy. He's very bright, very accomplished. He's done a huge amount of work in the industry. And he's the one who created the Davis Sterling Act. That begs the question, can you explain how the Davis Sterling Act kind of came into being? Well, in the 1960s is when HUD, FHA, they started backing. They decided they were going to back this concept called condominiums. And so condominiums started taking off and around the country. And in the 60s, uh, you know, a slow start and then ramping up in the 70s and then the early 80s, just a huge amount of construction involving common interest developments. So not only condominiums, but land developments and various other forms of common interest developments. And there was no body of law that governed them. And a professor out of San Diego, a law professor, Catherine Rosenberry, approached her assemblyman, Larry Sterling, and said, we really need to do something about this, you know, growing industry of common interest developments, and there needs to be some body of law dealing with it. And so he eventually agreed and said, okay, then let's you know, float a bill. And thus, they put together a group of attorneys and managers, management companies, CEOs, and developed what became the Davis Sterling Act. And what's interesting is that as it was going through the committee process, it was the Sterling Act. And the future governor of California, Mr. Davis, the uh, Gray Davis, was chair of the housing committee and called him in and said, well, we need to adjust the bill in order to get it passed. Just the name? <laughs> and so it was the name. And in fact, Mr. Sterling uh, said, okay, do you want to call it the Sterling Davis Act? He goes, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> so it uh, became the Davis Sterling Act. Savvy politician. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, Gray Davis went on to become governor of California. Larry Sterling then went on to become a senator, state senator, and then was appointed to the bench uh, and became a judge. And uh, was a judge for a number of years before retiring and then joining our firm. And so that's how the act came about. And what's interesting is it was not that much in the initial draft, and that was it went into effect January 1 of 1985. It has been amended every single year since then and has grown significantly. And in 2014, it had become so large that they needed to reorganize the entire body of law. And they renumbered everything, broke it all up into more numbers, made it easier to find material. And in 2014, relaunched it again as the Davis Sterling Act. I remember that was a lot of fun to go through all of our articles and, you know, readjust and the civil code numbers. Change all the civil code numbers. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I learned when I was kind of researching this for the, the podcast was about Prop 13 in 1978 and how that affected community associations. As far as uh, when Prop 13 was passed, it severely limited the ability of local governments to raise the property taxes to take care of the public services. So before approving any new residential developments, local governments began forcing developers to privatize all kinds of services that had previously been supplied by them, like street maintenance, uh, landscaping, sewer lighting, security on the parks, etc., which is, is really interesting and makes a lot of sense why those amenities then became the responsibility of associations. Yes. That, in fact, is what drove a lot of the growth in California, is that the uh, cities, the local governments, discovered that if they required developers to create a common interest development, they could continue to tax all of the individuals living in the development, but they didn't have to provide any services. The, the developments themselves provided their own services, their security and street maintenance and amenities and those kinds of things. And so at, at that point, once they discovered that they could do that, they then started requiring 80, 90 percent of all new construction now in California is a common interest development. And currently. That's why it's just currently. That's why it's exploding. Yeah. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. And, you know, I find that for the most part, the community association amenities, parks, et cetera, are much more well cared for than the uh, parks in the public domain. Yes, as a rule, they are. And yeah. it's because you've got private ownership of them. And so they are much more interested in maintaining them because it's theirs. As well as a requirement in their governing documents to maintain yes. them. And that's what, what the boards are set up to do, is to maintain the common areas of the association. So you've got davissterling.com, which is 
the preeminent end-all be-all for information on the Davis-Sterling Act. As far as I'm concerned, that's, I don't know anywhere else to go to look for these things. How many folks have to work on that full time to maintain it? Well, it's interesting. When I first created it, this was in 2003 is when I started working on it and launched it January 1 of 2004. And I was looking for a name like HOA law or condo law, something like that. Those domains were already taken. And then I looked and saw that Davis Sterling was not. And so named it davissterling.com. Built the website, started writing all the uh, information that goes on it, and it is now thousands of pages of information and hyperlinks between the pages, so it's easy to jump from one to another to find the information. And it's gotten so big that it's become, as you pointed out, a, a bit more difficult to maintain than when it was a very small website. And it grows on an annual basis, the content. And so I've got and another attorney that works with me on updating all the information. And we have a staff member that works with us on keeping the website current. And then your blog and newsletter are kind of wrapped up into the website as well. Yes. And so uh, people continue to send in questions. Uh, we answer them through the newsletter. And, and make get... references, hyperlinks to the applicable codes. Exactly. All the different codes and different pages on the website. And then we post the newsletters on the website. How many hits on average does it get annually? Well, I can tell you we have a million sessions per year on the website and six and a half million page views per year. So a session would be a user going to the website? Correct. Okay. And a so, million. Yes. And so this is, it has become the online resource for attorneys, for judges. We've had judges. For insurance professionals. Insurance professionals, legislators, virtually any, anybody that's got any involvement in the industry now uses it as a resource. Well, thank you for the Davis Sterling website. We appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> now, kind of switching gears here, what do you think are some of the most challenging issues facing the CID industry? Well, the industry, because it's driven by volunteers, finding volunteers willing to give their time to serve on boards of directors has been challenging. And associations have struggled with trying to get people to do that because the burden on those volunteers continues to grow annually as more and more legislation comes out and uh, adding more restrictions and imposing greater burdens on these boards of directors. And that is, as you know, members look at the potential liability insurance issues, which you're familiar with, they're concerned about exposure to liability as well as just the general workload involved in with the association. And so that has probably been the most difficult, the most challenging for uh, associations is finding directors. Probably the next is the maintenance well, issue. Before we move on from that, do you have a recommendation for your clients uh, as far as how to get more people involved? Well, I, the recommendation I have is to maybe close the legislature for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> that would help a lot. But trying to induce members, their associations have different ways of trying to do that, talking to their neighbors, getting them to volunteer their time to come onto the board, sending out pleas. But beyond that, there really isn't any easy way to get people involved. Although one had a solution that was to announce that they were raising the dues by 20%. <laughs> and suddenly a lot of people were interested in serving on the board. Wait, what? <laughs> The threat of financial peril. Yes. It always works. An attorney's best friend, for sure. The other thing that is challenging for associations is that California tends to be a bit litigious. And so associations are attractive targets because they're deep pockets. And so anytime anything happens, members think that it's, you know, the association is automatically liable and should be sued and that they can somehow cure all of their problems by suing the association. And so that's one of the unfortunate sides of our practice is that we do have a fair amount of litigation that we deal with in working with associations and dealing with insurance appointed counsel and dealing with the interpretation of governing documents and how they interplay with insurance. And, you know, there's just a lot of complications because there's not any uniformity in the governing documents. And in fact, 
the master sets, our templates that we maintain, we're updating them on a regular basis. And so from year to year to year, we're constantly updating and updating because of all the changes in the law. New bills being passed, New bills, right. And even with insurance issues, insurance is much a mystery to most people and including a lot of attorneys who try to read policies and are just lost in the, all of the text and what's covered and what's not covered. So, of course, there are whole specialties in insurance coverage, coverage counsel that deal with these kinds of issues. So that's a major problem dealing with litigation and then dealing with the, probably the third, just trying to keep up with regular maintenance on buildings and reserve issues and making sure they've got enough money without offending their neighbors that they're raising their dues. And so it's a constant struggle between do we raise the dues or not raise the dues? Do we special assess, not special assess? Do we increase our funding for reserves? And of course, if they decide that the kindest thing to do is to never raise dues, what happens is eventually they get hit with huge special assessments because they're dramatically under-reserved and they don't have enough for operations. And so it turns out that Regular small increases to deal with cost of living increases are much more palatable palatable and easier for people to absorb than going for 10, 15 years with no increases and then getting hit with large increases and special assessments. And even if they're reserving properly, they could still be hit with those kinds of large assessments if, you know, an item like pipes are not included in the reserve study. Yes. And in fact, that's one of the issues we looked at. Uh, I'm on the, uh, you mentioned the Foundation for Community Association Research. And it's what our, is that? It's a nonprofit foundation based out of Virginia and established by the Community Associations Institute. And it does research on community association issues throughout the country. And the most recent, well, there are a couple of ones. The, we did one on cybersecurity and the impact of the growing threat of cyber attacks against uh, associations which we published a couple of years ago, and that was really significant for the industry. Then the next one was aging infrastructures. And we did extensive research nationwide on how are associations coping with aging infrastructures and what kinds of surprises are they finding. And the one of them that you mentioned is the stuff that's hidden in the walls, which is typically plumbing lines. So plumbing lines uh, out of sight, out of mind, and they don't reserve for them. And at some point, they start failing. And, it has to. Yes. And then you've got, in addition to the cost of replacing them, there's the damage that they cause to the common areas. There's the insurance issues that get pulled in and whether it's covered or not covered. The threats of lawsuits by individual owners damaged by the water, the sudden flooding, and then potential mold issues and personal injury issues. And so those become uh, fairly significant to deal with, both from the legal side and the insurance side. I'm sure you've dealt with many of those issues yourself. It's a real problem right now. Yeah, the, all the pipes, you know, because there was so much construction of condominiums in the 60s that now we're getting to that point in the 60s and 70s where those pipes have reached their limit and they're failing. Yes. Yeah. And especially with old materials like galvanized pipe and oh, yeah. then switching to copper and then mixing. In fact, we represent the oldest association west of the Mississippi, which was established in 1928 in Northern California. We deal with others that were established in the 1930s. And, you know, and the governing documents are primitive because they were not sure exactly what they were doing. They were kind of learning as they went and how to create these. And so sometimes the governing documents are only a few pages long whereas now they may be 60, 70 pages long. And each of the older associations, as you pointed out, starting in the 1960s, in fact, some that we have that are in the 1950s, materials have changed dramatically. Construction materials, roofing materials, the uh, water lines and drain lines, and going from galvanized to copper to now PEX, plastic lines. And so the keeping up with industry standards and now dealing with electric vehicle charging stations and electric vehicles and that were never planned for and trying to install infrastructure for those. So it's a continuing, ongoing, evolving issues involving homeowner associations. So the think tank essentially discusses these issues and tries to make recommendations on how to address them? Yes. 
And we're going to be publishing that on the aging infrastructures will be coming out shortly. And the one that you are now currently gearing up to do research on is the manager shortage. Because the industry has been growing at such a phenomenal rate, there's a shortage of managers in the industry. Qualified managers. Yes. Oh, yeah. Qualified. <laughs> let's, let's quantify right. that. <laughs> Absolutely. So management companies are very concerned about that. They've had a difficult time trying to find and recruit managers, train them. And of course, the CAI, that's one of their things is that they, they train, you know, they, they continue the education. But the problem is, if there's nobody to train, then what do you do? And so we're doing research on that now as to what the significance of the shortage, the, you know, the scale of it, where are management companies finding and recruiting people from, what kinds of things can be done to help deal with the shortage and the training and what we're looking at are junior colleges and setting up programs. There are some, you know, junior colleges that deal with apartment management, but not very many, if any, that deal with condominium management. Interesting. And so setting up programs for junior colleges. So the think tank would reach out to these community colleges yes. and say, hey, here's a need. Yes. Uh, and developing uh, course material for them and getting with, people into pulling them into the classes, training them, showing them that there is an entire career available for them in this industry that very few people know about. And um uh, and once they get into it, it's the industry is, the, is enormous. The variety and the things that are involved within it, some of which we've talked about, maintenance issues, insurance issues, legal issues, and then just dealing with people. You put people together in close quarters and tell them to govern themselves, you're going to have problems. And so there's always the good people and the not so good people. And so, and then there's the criminal element. And there's always somebody, they don't want to follow any rules about anything. And they're creating huge amounts of problems. They may be very litigious. And then there's also another element that we run into, and that is those that have mental or emotional problems. And what we're seeing is, like with hoarders living in condominiums, that's a, an actual disease and it's a real problem for associations to deal with. And then there's the problem of parents with children that have mental problems and they warehouse them in a condominium. So it's cheaper to buy a condominium and put them in it than to institutionalize them. So we're running into those kinds of problems as well. And what do you recommend that a board does? How can they deal with that? That is probably the most difficult issues that we deal with are those kinds. Because with somebody, uh, for example, that is a bully, a threat from a, you know, a law firm on their letterhead that they're going to sue them if they don't stop you know, misbehaving, they tend to comply. But when you've got someone with mental issues, it doesn't have any impact on them. Mm -hmm. And they just don't recognize the exposure. And so for boards of directors, the first thing they need to do is call legal counsel. And it's going to be a long process dealing with it. It's not going to be easy, but it can usually be dealt with. And they just have to recognize there is no quick fix on dealing with it. Are there city organizations that, that can help? Yes, there are. But whether they actually help is another matter. Sometimes they will step in and assist. Other times they're on overload. They have their hands tied. They don't want to get involved. They can't get involved because they're too busy with other more serious issues. And they'd rather that the association's board deal with it. So it's a mixed bag dealing with uh, governmental agencies. I wanted to ask you briefly, actually, about uh, SB 323, the new Inspector of Elections right. requirement. It's a Senate bill that passed mm -hmm. this last session which has caused a lot of grief in the industry because the requirements are so onerous. Um, Cumbersome, absolutely. Yes. And the bill was very poorly written. It has a lot of internal inconsistencies. It's caused a lot of intended and unintended consequences for associations. And everyone, all associations in California, of which there are between 50 and 60,000 associations, housing probably about 10 million citizens in California, they all have to rewrite their election rules. And they are looking at having to amend their bylaws. The election cycle for associations used to be 45 to 60 days. Now they're looking at 120 days, so four months of election that's involved. And for volunteers, that's just too much. And so as soon as they 
in an election. Eight months later, they're starting another one. Having to spend money on completely independent inspectors, not being able to establish their own qualifications as to who can be on the board and who can't, all being imposed by the legislature. Actually, it was one woman in her organization who decided that she wanted to make changes to the industry, and she got Senator Wykowski to carry the bill for her. And uh, unfortunately, it passed, and now we're dealing with the aftermath. I was blown away by the, you know, there's a list of, I think it's seven or eight different entities that could serve as the inspector of elections. And just reading through it, I, I was just shocked <laughs> at how little thought was put into who could actually serve yes. as an inspector of elections, given the implications beyond that election. Yeah. And in fact, the insurance issues involving inspectors, which you wrote about, you and Tim Klein, which I thought was a great article because you touched on something that nobody else had raised yet. And that was, are they truly insured? How do you deal with insurance and what kind of insurance do you require? And what about indemnity provisions in these agreements? Because all of them have indemnity provisions because the inspectors don't want to get sued. They know that uh, associations are litigious and that if somebody's unhappy, they sue the association, but they automatically sue the inspector at the same time. And you can't blame the inspector for putting that indemnity provision in their contract. Not if at all. The manager or the board is not going to notice it. And, you know, it's sad, but they want to protect themselves. Yes. And the requirements now for elections are so difficult that it's going to be very easy for associations to misstep, to miss something, to not do something entirely correct. And then on technical issues, they can get sued. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're expecting to see a wave of litigation involving now the new election rules. So from an insurance best practices standpoint, uh, I'll just say that, you know, we recommend it, I'm sure you do as well. When you hire that inspector of elections company, you make sure that they are naming the association as additionally insured on their own policy and that they have a policy in place. Yes. Yes. And then the problem is that there are so many new startups now as inspectors mm -hmm. that I don't think all of them actually have insurance. They're carrying insurance. And so that's something that uh, association boards need to be careful about to make sure that they, one, hand the contract over to legal counsel to review and check with insurance to make sure that they do have proper insurance. And one of the obstacles that I've heard raised uh, from some community managers is that you know, say you hire this inspector of elections company, you're paying them the money, you're handing off the, you know, passing the um, liability on to them, but then you can't get quorum at the board meeting. Yes. And then you got to pay them to come out again. And maybe a third time. And so one of the things that we're recommending to associations statewide is that they amend their governing documents to eliminate quorum requirements for the election directors, cumulative voting, uh, to eliminate proxies and eliminate, you know, there are a number of things that they can do that would make their elections a lot easier. And just getting rid of the cumulative voting and quorum requirements is the easiest because then you only hold elections once. And then another thing would be elections by acclamation. When the number of directors is less than or equal to the number of open spots, the open seats, then there's no need to hold the expensive election. And so that's another thing that we're recommending go into the bylaws and election rules. Interesting. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today, uh, Adrian Adams, the creator of the Davis Sterling website. Thank you so much, sir. And how can folks get a hold of you? Going to the website? Certainly. We've got actually three websites. So there's the Davis Sterling, which is the research website. And that's Davis Dash. Yeah. Sterling, Sterling.com. Sterling with an I. Yes. And then we have an entire body of law was created for commercial and industrial common interest developments. They used to be under the residential side, the Davis Sterling Act, but they became so prominent in their own right, the entire body of law was created just for them. And so we have the commercial .com, which deals with all of the laws dealing with commercial and industrial common interest developments. And then we have our own website for the law firm, which is the adamsterling.com website. So any one of those will get you to us, and there's a way to contact us through them. And they can subscribe to your newsletter uh, yes. or your blog on there as well. Yep. And we've got currently about between twenty five and 30,000 subscribers on our newsletter. And we don't ask for anything from them. No uh, information, no personal information of any kind, just their email address. And they can get free legal advice by sending you a question on there. <laughs> yes. Well, 
general legal advice. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you so much for joining us. As we end our episode, we'd like to remind our listeners that if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for topics you'd like to learn more about, you can email us at feedback at hoashow.org. Join us next time on The HOA Show. To share or subscribe to The HOA Show, visit us at hoashow.org. There, you'll be able to listen to other episodes, find helpful resources relating to HOAs, provide feedback, submit questions, and check out other great stuff. The HOA Show podcast has been made possible by the contributions of Klein Agency insurance brokers, leaders in the community association industry. The views and opinions expressed by the podcast, its presenters and guests do not constitute legal advice. For more information on how the topics and discussion apply to you, please consult with your own legal counsel.